Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode seven. Do you want to learn more about async IO in Python? How about with an example where you can see and hear events being triggered in real time? This week, I talk with Lucas Longa, and he's created a talk for PyCon 2020 about using async IO with music. In this talk, he shows examples of coroutines, gathering, the event loop, and events being triggered to create a live piece of music. We talk about his role as the release manager for Python 3.8 and 3.9. He also provides background on the origins of his very popular, uncompromising code formatter, Black, and the types of problems it can solve inside of an organization. Lucas previously worked for Facebook, which is where he started Black. He talks about recently moving back to Poland and discusses his current work for EdgeDB, building a new generation object relational database. So let's get started. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. Interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Welcome, Wukush. I was wondering if you'd give us a little bit of your background. Cool. Uh, happy to be here. I'm the release manager for Python 3.8 and 3.9 currently. I work with all sorts of stuff for Python, but mostly typing related things these days. So, you know, making sure that you can actually check your program and document them for types and as well, like for that to be usable. So the latest pep that I've been working on, like, you know, for Python 3.9 is definitely the usability pep. I'm getting paid by HDB to work on their product, which is a really good relational object database that uh, is a more high level approach to uh, databasing than regular relational data stores. However, it does give you all the guarantees that a traditional relational data stores give you, which uh, NoSQL databases rarely do. It is in fact based on Postgres, uh, but gives you a more high level query language for it and integrates GraphQL. I mean, just and essentially, it is like a web framework integrated inside your database for you with migrations and all sorts of niceties. Uh, so yeah, feel free to try this out as well. Cool. Yeah, like I, I don't know what else you want to know. Uh, I, I am based in Poland at this point. I used to be in the United States for quite a bit and in Vancouver, British Columbia before that working for Facebook. That's behind me now, like I'm kind of sheltered in place, Poznań, Poland, that's Western Poland, pretty close to Berlin, in fact. Yeah, I was just looking at the map on that. I've talked to a couple of people in that area of Europe. <laughs> one of the authors is from Oslo, and then one of the video course creators, he's down in Odessa, Ukraine. So I was just kind of looking at the map and kind of like based on time zones. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. When did you move back to Poland? Well, it was a two-step process, actually. So, like, um, back then, like, being in the Bay Area, uh, like, was very, very good to me, actually. I, I enjoyed it immensely. But it kind of dawned on me and my wife that, like, you know, kind of if, if we actually want to spend some significant time with our parents, like, we really have to go back, like, right now and not in 10 years, right? You know, that's the time where... yeah. The, our, our son is still like, you know, a nice grandson for them. You know, he's still a kid and whatnot. Like it was the good time. So we decided, well, you know, at the end of the school year to just kind of move to Europe. But Facebook wanted to keep me around. So I decided that instead of just like quitting and, and quickly moving, what we can do, and we did that, uh, is just to do this month long road trip coast to coast, uh, you know, from the Bay Area to New York. Wow across all sorts of national parks and whatnot, like visiting quite quite a few of our Python friends as well, which was amazing. And, you know, kind of people that live off the beaten track and we still managed to visit them in their houses, which was really nice. Yeah, so we did that. And then my wife with my son moved uh, like directly to Poland while I worked for Facebook for another six months from London, trying to set up this kind of remote gig for myself, like for a... Uh, for, um, you know, kind of a, a longer period uh, of time. But ultimately that fell flat, like, you know, kind of Facebook corporate was not, you know, kind of w willing to have a full-time remote worker from a different time zone than everybody else. Uh, 
So yeah, like so I, I so I simply quit. I decided not to have this kind of stressful situation by Christmas. So like you know, like for Christmas 2018, I was a free spirit. And that that kind of took me, you know, possibly what was it? It's like nine months of just seriously just decompressing and you know, kind of <laughs> Dealing with like just being a dad, you know, re renovating the house and, you know, kind of taking it easy until Yuri Salivanov approached me and said like, hey, man, like we're working on this HDB thing, you know, kind of can you uh, can you help us? And that actually sounded interesting enough to just, you know, interest me to kind of stand stand up and say, hey, like not only is this a product written in modern Python, it's Python 3.8, it's in async IO, it's typed, you know, it's it's kind of, it shows the best that Python has to offer, but also the product from the user's perspective is very promising. So I decided, hey, like, let's do this. And I set up a company and now, yeah, we're working together ever since, like, you know, so that's over six months now. That database sounds really cool. And you said it has roots in Postgres? Yeah, so it is based on Postgres. Like, you know, kind of, it doesn't make sense in 2020 to just restart a database project and kind of figure out all the sorts of, you know, hard gotten knowledge that Postgres has, like, like just again, like, why would you do this? Like, why would you go and try to figure out, like, you know, how the process management should look like, how you should store data, you know, block to block on the on disk and whatnot, right? You know, there's, there's plenty of amazing experience that the code base, you know, kind of shows you. And we're just using that while focusing on providing better usability and kind of this sort of integration that people expect now, right? So like GraphQL is a good example, but HQL, which is the native query language, actually provides you with just this bit more of expressiveness, right? It's, it is an object, as I said, database. So like the links between objects are the powerful feature. So the set-based query language is, is really something that sets this product apart from all those GraphQL native ones. You can make queries that are way more kind of expressive and advanced than you could do in a GraphQL. Okay. So if someone was coming from, say, a SQL background, which is my background, I was working in banks and different areas with everything from the Microsoft kind of sets of databases to Oracle and everything kind of being routed around SQL. What are some of the advantages that say, you know, GraphQL and in your case, EdgeQL in layman terms, how does that enhance doing queries? Yeah. So imagine this. So like in the end, there's going to be tables. It's going to be stored in, in, in like in Postgres low level, but this is not how you think about your data set. What you're going to be thinking of are going to be objects that you declare with a high level schema. Okay. And then you can migrate the schema forward and this is done for you. But you're thinking in terms of this high level schema. So there's objects and they have links, uh, they have some properties and whatnot, they can have functions. So the, the first thing that you're going to notice is that this is already way nicer than just having DDL statements, which are not transactional and, you know, they're very problematic in many cases. Like you don't have to deal with this. You just have a schema that you can read and use it as documentation, actually, right? And later from that, uh, the HQL query language allows you to just write queries that are then, in fact, compiled to highly optimize SQL for you. So it's like a Postgres expert that you have with you at <laughs> all times. Like, you know, the queries that are going to be used are the, are queries that you would not write yourself. So this is already better than an experienced Postgres, you know, kind of database administrator, but it's just leagues better than what ORMs typically do because ORMs are usually very bad at like, you know, being super efficient because they really have to map nicely to the objects of a particular programming language like Python. So there's plenty of optimizations they just cannot do. And HQL is different in the, say, in the sense that it doesn't map to a native objects in Python. It provides you its own objects, but how they look like, what attributes they have and whatnot depends on the query you're doing. So, you know, technically speaking, the shape that you're going to receive that depends on your query, but that allows it to be really efficient. Like, so you're using something that feels like an ORM, but if you're actually benchmark it, can just blow them out of the water easily. Oh, cool. What's the target market for this product, this uh, EdgeDB? Yeah, so like being at Facebook, I've seen a powerful database like this 
in use, which actually powers Facebook, right? It wasn't HDB. It was something that is uh, kind of similar to it in certain sense, right? It was based on like a front end was Memcached just with like a better query language. And it was a write through cache to MySQL, right? So also it wasn't a database created from scratch. It was also building on uh, building blocks that were already there. But again, having a graph database, you know, an object database where they have objects and associations between them allowed regular programmers at Facebook, of, of which there are thousands, right, to write very expressive queries without worrying whether those queries are going to kill the database because they're going to take, you know, two seconds to complete every time. Okay. And the products that they were able to ship due to this, like, you know, to this day, just work and people no, don't even think about like how complicated the things that happen are, you know, like uh, just any two Facebook users of which there, there's 2 billion, like, you know, can just talk with each other, like essentially in real time at any given time, can comment on each other's posts at any given time. And it just works like almost to real time, right? Like, so pretty much this is like, like a globally distributed database. And I've seen this technology at work. Like I worked on the cache and validation for it, right? So it was like this tricky part for quite a while. And I just always wished for a product like this to be available like to, to the small guy, right? You know, to, to somebody who doesn't have a globally distributed system, but <laughs> right. still would like the expressivity, right? Like, you know, you would still like for even for a smaller system to just be able to not worry about like, oh, is this query too advanced? Should I do this in Python instead? Should I denormalize my schema? Like, you know, those kinds of silly questions that you should not even think about if you're not, not having like petabytes of data in your data set. And yet often you do. So uh, this product really is kind of like, we're thinking of it as a database stack, right? So it's it's like, you like Postgres, you understand it's good, Okay, but like just a, a power up for this to the point where you're no longer thinking of it as a relational database because what you're operating with are objects that have links between each other. So you mentioned that it has a lot of the advantages of Python 3.8 and, and also async IO in it. Yep. That kind of brought me to the, the idea of your talk that you were going to be doing at PyCon. I guess you actually are still doing it, but you're going to record it in advance and put it on the PyCon YouTube channel. Yes, I'm I'm actually recording it as we speak. Yes. Yeah, so like I'm in the process of fighting with OBS <laughs> to make sure that like you know you can see both my face and the presentation. Well, like w we'll see how it turns out like you know I I I'm stubborn. I'll 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 get it to work, but so far my presentation is flickering. It's kind of frustrating to me. Already gave it two times today and like every time that something was wrong. So I'm going to have to give it the third time. I have it really well oiled and practiced at that point. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's it's an interesting presentation. I was very proud of it, like, you know, when I was working on it, because it is not your typical, like, you know, PowerPoint slides and a, and, and a guy talking. Like, there's actually, like, there's hardware involved and there, there's actual audio done in real time. Right. There is some small kind of amount of live coding involved. It is kind of different in the video because you can kind of, you know, make a, um, a few allowances that are in, you know, really hard, like if you're giving the presentation actually live, but it's still, you know, essentially the same thing. Yeah. What I wanted for people to see, to perceive like in a live setting is that, hey, man, like from from scratch, we are doing this thing and it makes sounds like, you know, as we are here and, you know, you can see it happen. You can you you are there and there's some randomness to it. So you know that the thing that you're watching is like unique in the scale of, you know, kind of to, to use a grand language, like universe, right? Right. So like it, it is an interesting presentation in that case. Like, you know, I found it like to, to be just a more interesting way to introduce async IO to people, to maybe get people hooked on it because it's very easy to just draw graphs like, you know, with web requests and tell people, hey, you can really handle 10,000 requests a second with this thing. But it doesn't really speak to your imagination much, right? Right. But if you are actually showing people sequencing, right, with async IO where, oh, there's one drum here and there's another drum here and there's a baseline and yet, you know, some kind of over notes on that same baseline and all of it actually you can hear happen in virtually real time. 
that speaks volumes to people, right? Like, you know, they can actually perceive that, oh yeah, this is actually cool. That would be impossible without async IO, right? Yeah. So why don't you just, you already gave some of the background on it, but maybe from a high level, just sort of introduce what the talk was about just to kind of give the... Oh yeah, of course. Uh, so for, for the longest time, like, you know, I, I did a bunch of teaching on async IO, right? It is a thing that changed how I program Python. I use AsyncIO even for applications that don't involve networking. In fact, Black, the formatter, d does use AsyncIO in it uh, as well. Oh, wow. It, it makes sense for it because it's just, like, you know, it is a very good sub-processing API, right? So, like, you can actually run multiple sub-processes very easily with AsyncIO and have uh, the results of those sub-processes kind of gathered for you. So even if you're not doing networking, async IO can still help you. But what I had actual trouble with is to get through this, you know, magic thinking stage of async IO with people, right? So like when, when you first introduce this concept, it is way different than anything else that you've seen before in Python, right? Like before in Python, you had a function, it reads from top to bottom, you're done. <laughs> right. Right. With uh, coroutines, it's like, oh yeah, like, you know, actually calling it doesn't do anything. You have to await on it. And why, why actually, you, you know, do you have to do this? What happens if you have many and you're gathering? Why does it do a thing? Like, you know, the more I taught and I thought of examples for how async IO works, you know, and, and whatnot, like the more I thought, like, even if you have a nice text or graphical console that just, you know, shows you things happening at the same time, that doesn't really make people suddenly click and understand what they're seeing, you know? So I, I'm a hobbyist musician. So at some point I just had this idea that like, you know, why not make coroutines kind of push buttons on my synthesizers, right? Like, why not make coroutines play sounds? And through MIDI, right? Through MIDI, you can actually achieve this, where you can have hardware synthesizers uh, be sequenced with very simple, it, they are kind of amazingly simple coroutines. And this is what the presentation is showing. It's actually demonstrating um, production-grade sequencer, actually. Like, you know, you could very easily just put it out there like in a life act and use it without worry that it's going to kind of crap out on you because it is based on async io which is used in production in probably all of you know the fa a and g um you know corporations so it is really well battle tested but you can also make pretty sounds with it <laughs> yeah no I, th I thought that was really cool and one of the things that i was wondering about is I think it's admirable, like you struggling to try to think of other ways to explain this concept to people because, you know, the majority of the tutorials that I see there about async IO basically use this example of just time dot sleep and just, you know, having things sort of normally would have to wait and progress through. And it seems like sort of like almost sort of a fictitious example because it's rare that you'd want to just throw sleeping into your code. Yeah, I agree. But in this case, you're having it wait for very specific events to come in. And in this case, the networking is through MIDI, which is kind of a, like you said, it's a very simple protocol. I have a background in teaching it in the sense that, you know, it's directional, which is kind of interesting. There are, you know, individual events in the stream. In general, like as a protocol, it's, you know, it's kind of old. It's been around, gosh, what, 40 years almost. What's nice about it is the idea that you can say, okay, here's this event and this thing coming in. And then you're using sort of like a scheduling for these things to happen, which I thought was really kind of neat. I think confusion can happen to a lot of people with teaching async IO and trying to learn it, at least in my head also, is the idea of this concurrency versus parallelism uh -huh. and sort of the confusion that happens there. Can you speak to that? Yeah. So like while working on the async IO and music talk, I had this kind of a weird feeling that, you know, me doing this talk for a live conference is constraining me in my available time that I have for the talk. And I felt like, you know, to a certain extent, like it's the, it's the viewer of the talk who is going to suffer from it because you're kind of rushing through some concepts just because the slot, the time slot that you have on the schedule in a physical room, in a physical conference center, like it just allows you for 45 minutes plus setup and maybe some questions, right? 
Right. So I feel like 45 minutes is still, th- those are the longer slots in uh, in the schedule for <laughs> right. PyCon. So I was really lucky to get one and I was kind of ecstatic. That was the first time that, you know, kind of I managed to do this. However, that was still like very short to really just say like, hey, not only am I going to teach you MIDI and sequencing and show you like a live, you know, kind of tune with two hardware synthesizers, but I'm also going to teach you async IO in half an hour, right? Like, let's go. <laughs> yeah. So then I thought like, actually, this might be too ambitious, right? You know, or like, you know, not to call it like downright naive, right? So what I thought of really is like, hey, like what if, I actually split part of this, right? What if I didn't assume that the person watching the video knows zero about AsyncIO? What if I already assume some level of knowledge and then I do a separate video, you know, not PyCon related, but just a separate video, just put it on the HDB YouTube channel. Okay where I actually take my time and introduce AsyncIO, like, you know, in a slower pace, like actually going through the motions of explaining why this is a good idea and later showing, you know, this is the event loop without any coroutines yet or whatever, just become familiar with the loop and then introducing coroutines and just playing with them as a construct that we don't know how it works, but we just learn to use it, right? And later on, just have an episode where you show it under the hood and you explain how this magic actually comes to happen. And then just connect the dots increasingly while the async IO and music talk is really kind of starting already from some familiarity level and just allow ourselves to just go deeper in this direction. So the reason why I'm kind of doing all of this intro for you now is that while working on those other videos for HDB, just I- introducing async IO, I found this amazing analogy of concurrency and parallelism. And that analogy is the analogy of a bartender, right? So right. a single bartender can only produce one beverage at a time. However, they can take care of multiple customers at the same time. So that is concurrency without parallelism. If you wanted parallelism, you would need to have multiple bartenders. Right. But still, you are achieving concurrency already, right? You have multiple people at the bar, everybody's served, everybody's happy. So this is exactly what we are achieving in AsyncIO with an event loop on a single thread. We are never doing more than one thing at the same time. However, we are dealing with multiple things at the same time. Yeah, I think about like like a restaurant example also, when I was thinking about how I could try to create a question around it, the idea that we're normally things are having, like if you had a waiter that received this order and then went to the kitchen to have the kitchen create it, if the waiter just sat there until the kitchen completed it and didn't do anything else, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of what you're trying to avoid. That's pretty similar, yes. Yeah, yeah. And in the idea that they could have this, you know, spinning ticket thing that you'd see like at a diner or something like that, where they can put these multiple events in there. And then as they have time to work on them, they could grab the next one. And the idea of uh, the asynchronousness of that, you know? Yeah, because like, you know, some things you can have pre computed. You can have a beverage that is already there. You just take it out of the fridge and you can present it like to the customer right away without even hitting the kitchen. So it's actually a pretty good, good analogy as well. Yeah. So I was thinking about the event loop that is the async IO loop that you're setting things up inside of. And I wonder if in some ways it could be similar to like a, a game loop. I know you're into games also. I know it may be different in say something like Pygame or Arcade, those you know popular Python libraries for that. But would you agree that that's a potential similarity in there? Yeah. So, so in, in fact, like it, it all goes like back to the, to the eighties, right? Like, you know, the, to the select statement, like, you know, it's essentially all of it is around the fact that you, you have multiple things to deal with in terms of input and output, right? And, you know, now like with networking, with kind of, you know, online gaming and whatever, like there's still even more, right? So for us, for a single game, you know, kind of there's multiple things that can happen like in each frame, right? But for a game, the kind of 
event loop that you're going to be using is rather different from networking um, event loops in the sense that you have this concept in a game of a tick, right? You want the things to happen in consistent timing, right? Like you want 60 FPS, but you don't want it to just float all the time because if it does, then it is not a great experience for people, right? Like, and if you allow this graphically, you will have to compensate it like in, in, in different ways, you know, so that things don't just magically speed up or whatever. So, <laughs> right. like, in, in fact, there is always a tick, especially with online gaming, right? Like, you know, you have to kind of agree when a given thing happened, like, especially with network latency, right? You know, this is how people actually survive playing online games together when they're uh, away, because otherwise, you know, like, think about it, like, you know, a simple ping will take you multiple uh, tens of milliseconds, maybe over a hundred milliseconds. So, you know, how can you play an action game with somebody how can you play an fps like you will never know who shot first right you know right. you'll have to ask george lucas to do <laughs> and, and maybe he'll answer wrong so you, you right you know it's it's kind of it's hard so so the tick is very important there so it's kind of like a it's a harder loop to write because the amount of things that you agree to put in a single uh loop iteration is finite, right? You, you cannot just decide to have an arbitrary amount of things to execute. In fact, like, you know, uh, there, there's a fascinating series of posts by John Carmack uh, about this. And like one of the surprising things that he um, recommends for game uh, development is that your uh, loop, right? Like the events that happen in, with every iteration of your loop in your game should always compute everything. And then you just throw away the things that you're not using at the time. Oh, wow. It's kind of, it, it almost sounds like, what? Like, that's wasteful. But no, it's consistent, right? So it is less likely for you to get surprised when things get really thick, right? They get, when things get really busy. Uh, so with, in the most important moments in the game, the most kind of emotionally engaging moments in the game, you are less likely to disappoint your user, right? Because you were ready for this all along. You were computing all of this kind of heavy factor all along. So that's, that's impressive, right? You know, that, that, that is something that almost goes against everything that you learn from software development. But again, <laughs> gaming is... Efficiency-wise, yeah. Yeah, right. But it's almost like a different industry in this sense, right? Like the, the, there's different trade-offs and you're optimizing for a different kind of thing. Yeah, so I was thinking about that. And one of the things as I was watching the previous, you know, one you did on Code Dive, I learned a lot about, you know, this kind of concept that as you create these coroutines and, you know, sort of gather them, what I was thinking about is that a lot of that is sort of, I don't know, pre-processing it or, or sort of staging it, if you will, to go back to like our bartender example and, and making those events just ready to go so that they can be triggered, if you will. And I think maybe that's what's unique about it. Am I, am I right in my explanation? Is that making sense? Yeah. So with Async IO, the thing that you're, you know, supposed to get at some point like of, of its use is that while most of the time you're writing a wait and you're calling a, a coroutine as if it were a function, uh, like you can actually create coroutines, right? By calling them and just store them for a while and just pass them somewhere else. And somebody else in a different place will await on them then, right? Because they're first class objects, just like regular functions in Python are. So this is what enables you to set up multiple ones and call them. So they're ready to go, but they're not starting yet. Right. And only later you gather them. So now they go at the same time. Like this is immensely useful because like the, the return shape of those multiple coroutines can be exactly what you need at a given point in time. You can make, you know, kind of wait for tasks. You can just use gather. You can just put a thing as a uh, something that, that is supposed to be run in, in background, right? You know, so you it's fire and forget. You don't really care about it anymore. Like, so there's multiple patterns that you can use for this, but it's all based on the fact that you're creating a coroutine by calling it and that makes it ready to go, but without awaiting, nothing will happen. And the awaiting you can compose using, you know, different kinds of, well, aggregates, right? So gather is just a very simple one. So I introduce it in the talk because it's kind of, it's almost visual, right? Like you can really see all those things that you're putting inside and you know that, oh, now all those are going to run 
until completion. It's it's pretty cool. Yeah, and I was thinking about like the example that you're creating by another definition, you've really created a a truly synchronous thing <laughs> in the sense that it's a sequencer and it's following the the clock from the drum machine. You know, it's waiting and hitting these events very specifically at at these time intervals. And there is the delay of MIDI being serial and only one event at a time, but it's still it's kind of cool. And you could change the tempo, and then <laughs> it's a synchronous thing. Yeah. So 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 that that was an issue that I had with this like from the start. So like, if it weren't for me talking with Glyph, like Glyph being the the original creator of Twisted, right? Like back in 2000, you know, like he's a great guy. Um, so the, the Glyph actually told me like, hey man, like, you know, don't, don't do music with, with Async IO. Like you shouldn't be doing it with Twisted either because like the event loop that we have there is, you know, kind of, it doesn't have any real-time guarantees. Like, you know, you, 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 you don't really know. Like, you know, if you just put too many things there, like, you know, things are going to go out of sync. So that kind of discouraged me for a while. But then I thought about this and, and, and what you're saying is totally right midi is a sync protocol so like as soon as you send a message it is supposed to be played on you know the receiving instrument right you know there's there's no scheduling there's no delays and whatnot like it plays but it's also a pipe that is just you know a single cable sending one message at a time so how can we just play with 128 notes of polyphony as as my kind of stage piano allows you know how is this possible well because if you just send 100 28 of them within one microsecond then effectively what a person is going to hear is those all, all of those notes were pressed at the same time right the resolution that you are looking at it's the important factor right like if if you are not trying to synthesize audio in re real time so if you're not trying to create the actual waves for which you would have to have tremendously higher resolution right you know okay yes. <laughs> yeah 44 kilohertz or like you know or, or or even twice as that or whatnot so that that would be hard to accomplish with python i agree with that but for me we have plenty of headroom to just do like rather crazy sec sequencing. And the amazing thing about this is that, you know, there's plenty of hardware and software sequencers now, like, you know, with, with the digital audio workstations, but also in hardware, like people like those things now. They're like, there's a user interface for anybody, right? Like, so whatever speaks to you, you will find a product that kind of satisfies this need. Like, you know, there's even a Polish company now called PolyEnd, which is recreating the traditional, like, 8-bit kind of tracker thing. Like, you know, that was the first music application I ever used at a computer on a Commodore 64 and later on Amigas, like, you know, like trackers, right? So, so now they're producing a hardware synthesizer well, like that is a tracker and it's a sampler and it can also track your MIDI hardware or whatnot. It's a, it's a hardware box, which is a tracker. So whatever, like, you know, kind of floats your boat, you can have it, right? But all of it, just falls short. It falls terribly short. Like, you know, if you compare it with the power of like a programming language, right? If, if you understand any Python, you can do sequencing that is just unheard of in any of those sequencers, right? Like you are now kind of leagues forward, like, you know, beyond anything else that, you know, those simplistic sequencers can do now. Yeah, that got me really excited. I was talking with Thea Flowers and, and she, when last conversation I had sometime last week, she mentioned to me this uh, environment. I don't know what else better to call it, but it's called Orca. Yep, and it's uh, sort of a visual, you know, interface, and you know, it uses letters, and you basically can create all these sort of MIDI generators and stuff. And I said, "Gosh, with what you were showing in this talk, it wouldn't be that much of a stretch to create something, you know, in Python doing that." And then I would have you know control of the whole stack, which is pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. So my original plan with the talk was kind of, yeah, let's do async I1 MIDI. And, and, and it didn't go much farther than this because I didn't know, like, how is it going to actually look in the end? Like, you, you actually have to go and produce something and just kind of see what turned out. But at some point I had this idea, which is still kind of unfulfilled, but like you can easily imagine this actually being there, just not in a 45 minute time frame where <laughs> right. all of what we're doing now, like, you know, with this sequ sequencing, like just adding a server on top of this is trivial, right? Like it's, it's, it's just literally 
a few lines of async IO code just to just just to put an you know an HTTP endpoint over it, and now you could have other people sequence your um, synthesizers with you, right? So you could literally have a room full of people at PyCon just adding to whatever is is playing, right? So like you know at, at this point it becomes something that is kind of way way more powerful than you've ever you know kind of imagined because you can have like a relatively simple html application with you know some javascript just to draw some kind of sequencer there and just see the effect of it right on the real hardware on stage so yeah like you know the, it's it's kind of it would be cool to have this, but at the same time, you know, it's it's kind of hard to achieve everything in forty five minutes. So I, <laughs> I I still think I kind of got far enough to to make it to make it look like obvious that this composes well into the future. So you can still play with it and create something bigger than that. Yeah, I got to try out your code. I I have a circuit. Uh, I don't have the circuit mono, but I was able to to get it running with it, and yeah, it was pretty fun. And so I was like, oh, that's cool. You know, and then showed me all these other libraries I hadn't played with. I hadn't I haven't delved into the the MIDI library that you're using, and so that was kind of neat to see that in action. And then you're also using uh, something called UV Loop, which I heard you mention on a previous podcast. Yes, I was wondering what are the advantages of using that library. Yeah, so the event loop in AsyncIO to a large extent is a reference implementation. Right? Its goal is not to be the most performant event loop in in you know in the industry. That that would be a goal it cannot achieve just by the sense of just being implemented in Python. But it serves an important goal by being the reference implementation because it just shows the expected behavior and allows us to just test like the entirety of AsyncIO with an event loop that is easy to debug if stuff actually goes wrong. More importantly, it also works in PyPy and you know, all sorts of other advantages of it being pure Python. But then you actually move to uh, this kind of space where you are running AsyncIO in production. And at this point, you no longer care about, oh yeah, it's nice to be you know, teaching AsyncIO with a reference event loop that is in Python. Like now you want 100% available performance, right? Sure. Writing a very performant event loop is surprisingly tricky. So there are not very many implementations that actually are very battle tested. One of them is libuv. Libuv is used in Node.js and these days also in G-Event. Having this technology already available, uh, Yuri Sullivanov like thought of like, hey, could we actually make this power async.io? And he made it work. He wrote an application in Cython, right, that connects uh, libuv with async.io, serving an interface of an async.io event loop. So just by just importing uv loop and you know calling install on it, uh, you are replacing the reference implementation pure Python event loop in async.io with a version that is way faster. Right, so that allows you to actually use this in production. So for me in particular, I probably didn't even have to use this for MIDI purposes, like you know, for the purposes of my talk. But what I was absolutely petrified by and like afraid of the most is that hey, in this particular talk, it's not just PowerPoint and me. It is literally live running code on stage in front of people, <laughs> right? And I, I gave this talk at multiple conferences, like an early version of it, uh, just smaller events than PyCon would have been. That was my biggest worry always. Whatever audience there is, it would be super embarrassing if what I had to show them is it worked the day before, I promise. That, that would be terrible. Yeah. And usually those things tend to happen right in their own moment where your laptop just starts running some upgrade or, uh, you know, you're running low on disk space or whatever else, or it starts throttling because your battery is 20% or lower. There's just multiple bad things that can happen, right? So I wanted like for that particular crucial piece of code for me, the event loop, to just have like the fastest available. So at least this one variable just goes goes away. And absolutely, it, it did its job wonderfully. It, um, yeah, HDB also is using it. It's part of the reason why you can actually have a database server, which has good performance written in Python. That's cool. This is kind of a side question. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but um, I saw just some basics about it. But uh, MIDI 
is actually finally coming to version two, two point oh for MIDI. Oh yes, I looked at this. I I I looked at this. It's uh, at the same time I'm very excited about it. Like you know, there's already a first Roland kind of keyboard controller that that that, that ships with it. And it shouldn't even be very hard to just adopt whatever we're doing for MIDI 2.0. Uh, it is it is still very much like, you know, kind of in the same spirit, including really like part of MIDI 2.0 is the old MIDI. So like every MIDI 2.0 hardware will understand MIDI 1.0 messages as well. All of this is pretty cool. But at the same time, I had this kind of impression uh, when I last look at it is that, you know, it doesn't really matter what the specs say. Like what is actually going to matter is what the manufacturers do. Right, right. The reason why why I mention this is that even in the two pieces of hardware that I'm showing on, uh, like, you know, during the talk, which is Novation Circuit and Novation Mono Station, by that same manufacturer, by that same vendor, you have differences in the MIDI implementation, right? So it is not exactly the same. And then you you want to interface with your Moog synthesizer and it's going to behave differently. And you're controlling your things from a Yamaha keyboard and it's going to use right. different control change codes for, you know, similar things. The point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, kind of it is it is interesting, but it's kind of hard to say what we should be doing with it now without like, you know, their like, hardware being there already. And me not being part of any major hardware manufacturer, uh, like, you know, kind of, I don't really know whether this is for, you know, like of any use for me. Like one example why I, I, I'm not like kind of terribly excited by this is that one of the things that MIDI 2.0 is solving is that control change messages in MIDI 1.0 are 8-bit. Right. So at best, they can actually, since they're assigned, so like at best, they can give you 128 different values. So you feel like, oh, yeah, like that's plenty. Right. Well, not really, because if, if you have a knob that is analog on your synthesizer and you suddenly quantize it to just 100 uh, steps, like you will hear you will audibly hear the steps if that knob does something really drastic, like you might have resonance on your filter or something. MIDI 2.0 solves this problem. Amazing. Well, but we already did have a solution for this in MIDI 1.0, which were another group of control change messages that worked in tandem. So instead of uh, using one byte, you were using two bytes, right? And you just using two bytes is already just bumping the possible number of values enough for the quantization not to be heard uh, anymore. And yet, most hardware synthesizer manufacturers ignore this like they don't implement right they could but they don't so for example the high uh high level moog synthesizers do and you know kind of if you have like the subsequent 37 or you know even the voyagers or whatever yeah they they can do like you know all those kind of you know lush sweeps uh, on the on the filters they sound amazing and it's midi cool yeah but like the innovation uh, bits that i have they ignore this so there is just no way to control it well, with 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 fully, hmm, what I what, what I'm trying to say to use the full resolution, right? Yes, exactly. Without hearing the steps, right? Right. You know, we didn't discuss it much, but you know, the whole idea of the musical instrument digital interface of MIDI is was to get all these manufacturers to agree on a on a standard back in the '80s, because you know every every company was making their own different thing. You had you know companies like Sequential Circuits and and Moog and Yes. And a lot of them were using some analog tools of like control voltage. But in general, all of these things that are, you know, literally a keyboard, you know, a very similar human interface, they couldn't talk to each other. So it was kind of neat that they actually did form some form of a union, <laughs> you know, and create this MIDI Manufacturers Association. Yes. Yeah. At the time, but I agree that to a large extent that was successful. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, like the, the, the fact that you actually can have a third party digital audio station, like, you know, Ableton Live, and you can replace it with logic, like whenever you want. And you can just kind of go on a Windows box and just try something even different, right? Cubase, whatever, and have all of the hardware work exactly the same with you. Yeah. So th that is the dream. Like, you know, that the dream has been fulfilled. It's one of the protocols that actually were really well implemented. Like, you know, the, the problem though is that the manufacturers of those uh, digital audio workstations and whoever actually wants to fully integrate with any piece of hardware, 
they will find that uh, there is a basic set of commands, like of MIDI, MIDI messages, that everybody agrees on what they mean and implement them exactly the same. Like, for example, like, I, I don't really think there's any problem with like actually like synchronizing the clock and note ons and note offs. Like, you know, those things are easy. But even things like which channel do you put percussion on? Yeah. <laughs> and what do you do with the high channels and whatnot? Like, that is surprisingly weird. Like, you know, you can find hardware that actually just does something different offbeat. So, so yeah, like, you know, if you actually want to have the full MIDI implementation for a given piece of hardware, you actually have to get their spec sheet and just see which are the control change messages that they used for a given feature. Yeah, I, I used to be in that habit of going to the, the back of the manual and, and looking at that chart if they did a good job of it. And <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it was fairly readable. You know, if you knew the standards, it's like, okay, well, this one can do this thing called aftertouch and this thing can do, you know, which are definitely features that you want. And so I wonder about that too, with MIDI 2.0, if they'll, if they'll, <laughs> how they'll embrace it. And I mean, obviously they look at more channels and all these other kind of higher level things, but when you get down to it, it's always a, a, a meeting of the mind. Yeah. Th that's the one thing that may, maybe we don't know this yet. Right. And maybe they actually did the right thing here and it's all, all going to be fine because what I wanted to see when they announced, yeah, it's ready. Wasn't just one or, Roland keyboard that is kind of now disconnected from the world because like, okay, it has a MIDI 2.0, like, but who cares? Because there's no hardware synthesizer you can use it with. Like what I wanted to see is just like this declaration of like, hey, Roland and Yamaha and, you know, whoever else, like we just decided to just go full in on this and we release new models this year, all of us that have MIDI 2.0 and talk perfectly with one another. We tested it. Yeah. And then I'm like, oh yeah. I am on board with that. Like that <laughs> makes sure it works. But now with a single Roland keyboard, I'm like, well, you know, we'll see when we have at least three manufacturers, like did they implement it the same? Yeah. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your project Black. I was wondering what you can tell me about the origins of it. Well, in back in 2018, it was a rather, you know, unorthodox idea, like, you know, not to, not to even call it kind of dumb idea to just start a new formatter for Python, right? Like, you know, Python has been around since 1990. So what makes you think like, you know, anybody needs a new formatter in 2018. And in fact, <laughs> that was very much what I thought about this at the time. However, at the time I was working for Facebook who, well, which um, employs a lot of people with a lot of opinions. But at the same time, like has this kind of mantra of like, hey, like we should focus on the most important thing at all times, right? You know, le leave the kind of the nice to have things for later, right? Um, sure. And yet I've seen code reviews be very often derailed by discussing like the dumbest things like, you know, oh, you're missing a space, you know, after this comma or, you know, or you, you don't have a comma at all, or, you know, kind of, you shouldn't have used this many blank lines here or whatever else, like, you know, those silliest things ever. So we tried at some point to adopt uh, Google's app, right? You know, this, this project that is uh, kind of a few years older than, uh, than Black, you know, kind of it was already um, like stable and used uh, by a bunch of companies and projects. So we felt like, hey, we can do this. However, we actually found out that we really cannot adopt it wholesale. And that would be the only thing that would satisfy me, not to have one team at Facebook use it, but for, to have the entire company just kind of dive like straight in and just like say, hey, we, we are formatting Python right like, like this now. We were unable to do this because Yap is kind of both very configurable and has this brilliant idea that kind of backfires then uh, to implement formatting as as a dynamic programming problem. So what that means is mm. they, they they think of every formatting problem as a problem of fitting things that you have in your virtual line, meaning if you didn't have any column size uh, limits, a line could be just arbitrarily long, right? Very often it wouldn't be because you wouldn't write while true comma and then just write more code. You would always just break the line after the, the colon. But some of the expressions, like, I don't know, a very big dictionary, if you had, you know, no limits, you would maybe just put it in a single line. 
but we have limits. Maybe in your project, there are 79 characters per line. Maybe there are 80 characters per line. Maybe there are 120, like, you know, whatever the number is, at some point you're going to hit a line that is too long and you're going to have to fold it. You're going to have to break it into multiple lines. So what the app is doing in this scenario is it's looking at a list of things that you as the user counted against a good formatting. You put penalty numbers in configuration saying, I don't like it when this thing happens. I don't like it with, when that thing happens. You apply a number of penalty numbers in your configuration. And then the theory goes that the dynamic programming algorithm minifies the penalty score for a given formatting. So it literally chooses the least ugly formatting possible for the given line, right? Uh, conforming to this particular configuration file. Uh, so this for the most part works very well and actually kind of is interesting in the sense that it's not like super consistent always, but when it's not, very often it's because you configured it not to be, right? So it, it acknowledges some edge case, right? So that's cool. However, that makes it a very black box, right? Like, you know, you, you cannot really explain to a person who is unhappy with a given formatting why a given formatting ap appeared. Like, you know, what particular rule was used for it? You don't really know. You, the only thing that you know is it tried a bunch of penalties and this combination turned out to be the minimum penalty number for this line. So what you can do in this scenario is you can go to your configuration file and instead of 48, put 49 in some particular you know, place. And maybe it will fix that particular problem that somebody came to you with. But then a bunch of other lines that used to be nicely formatted are going to be formatted differently now. So you're going to have other people coming back to you saying like, hey, like this didn't used to ha happen. Like, why is it happening now? So it was all kind of very hidden from the end user, like what is happening? And in my particular uh, experience, most of the time people weren't after the perfect formatting because any any automatic tool that attempts this will fail. Like, you know, in inevitably, like, you know, those tools don't understand symmetry. They don't understand aesthetics. They don't understand that a different file was formatted like this and this one is supposed to be formatted the same thing. Uh, it, it, it's impossible, right? Like, you know, those are very uh, ambitious goals for a tool like this. Right. Uh, so instead, what people would rather want to see is just some measure of consistency. Even if it's not perfect, at least you know why, right? So you can just kind of, you know, shrug your shoulders and say, you know, who cares? Like, you know, let's move on. And in fact, we've had a more ambitious kind of formatter project at Facebook for a while and that failed. So at some point I just thought in 2018, you know, kind of, I would like to have a uh, as a birthday present for myself, just <laughs> just for my team and maybe a few other teams, just the simplest formatter I can ever write that just almost kind of looks like JSON, like, you know, does, does the same thing all over the place, like, you know, with regardless of what bracket pair that is, it does the same thing everywhere and just run with it. Weirdly, that was the right time for this for me that, you know, the, the initial alpha I pulled off in like six weeks, I think, you know, it's, it's still in the repo history, so you can follow that. But I obviously missed my birthday because, you know, as a programmer, you're not supposed to hit your deadlines. It's, it's just, it's, it's the rules. I, I don't make the rules. <laughs> but what I did actually make is a Pi Day of 2018. And that was a cute date. And, you know, I, I managed to just release the first alpha then. And by end of that day, I had like 500 stars on my repo. Wow. And I didn't understand what just happened. Like I, 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 I didn't understand why. Like I did have this kind of manifesto style sort of, uh, you know, read me that actually explained why I wanted to have an opinionated formatter that makes everything look consistent and, and how this makes things better. And in very short 
time, I had plenty of people coming to me saying, you know, if you only change this one thing because it doesn't work. And sometimes I would listen to them. And sometimes I'm like, no, that's literally why I wrote this. This stays. So we had conversations like, like this. And suddenly I've heard like, hey, virtual env is formatted with black. Oh, uh, you know, PyTest is formatted with black. And suddenly bigger and bigger projects adopted it. And finally, you know, I kind of bit the bullet and said like, hey, Facebook, like, are we doing this or not? And we reformatted 20 million lines. Wow. Like, 20 million lines with with black you know we, we just did it over the weekend you know like some people i'm pretty sure to this day I, I don't work there anymore like to this they probably are not happy with everything uh that black <laughs> is doing and and i acknowledge they're probably right you know like they're, they're, they're smart people but what i've heard later from most users actually is how happy they are not to have this conversation anymore about, you know, oh, you should do this in a different way. You should format this in a different way, especially the continuations, right? Like, you know, when you have the body of a bracket pair inside, you know, it's like, what do you do with that? So with Black, you always do the same thing. Well, soon enough, uh, there's going to be the 10th anniversary of me getting my comet bit to Python, right? There's, there's, a, there's multiple peps in my name, you know, in the, uh, in the language. And I'm the release manager for a while now. And yet, yeah. like, there's very few people who, like, acknowledge this to any, to any extent. But what everybody knows me for and what so many people thank me for is like, hey, man, like, you know, you solved so much, like, heartbreak with this tool for our team. You know, we, we use it now. Things are easier. So I'm like... I never expected this to become anything more than, you know, kind of my, you know, local tool that maybe a bunch of friends are going to be using. You know, it, it became a big thing way faster than I ever expected it to, to the point where now I'm kind of terrified to like declare it stable because I kind of <laughs> understand stable as being a tool that will not like, you know, screw you over and change its formatting significantly later. Right, because like one of the points of black is that hey, like I don't want part of the file to be formatted like this and another part to be formatted way differently. Like you know, so it doesn't support kind of as a as a design decision partial formatting. Uh, it's just you know, it, it either either your entire file is like this or or it, it's not at all. So that that is kind of a burden in the sense that we need to be really careful about changing the style later on even if those are good changes even if those are fixes they're going to be noise for people they're going to be annoying so yeah so at this point there's a bunch of acknowledged problems that we have on the issue tracker that we need to fix before we declare stable well, and as soon as I'm done with this async IO talk and OBS and a bunch <laughs> of other things, you know, related to this quarantine and everything else, like, you know, I have this on my list. Like, I feel the responsibility. In fact, Sentry uh, did sponsor Black with a grant of five grand. That was like a super nice move on, on their end. I, I, I never contacted them for it. Like, you know, I just received this out of the blue. It was awesome. So we did sponsor a bug bounty for it. You know, we have another one in the works, like, you know, th th this time I'm a bit more substantial than the first one. So, so this actually, so having the money involved is helpful, but at the same time, like, you know, we really need kind of time to do it and the, to be emo emotionally ready for it too. And, and that, that is kind of hard this time, uh, this time uh, in the world. So yeah. I do recognize that some people are really pushing me for just declaring whatever we have now stable and just be done with it. But that is not my ambition for it at all. My ambition is bigger here. Like, you know, I really want to have this kind of promise fulfilled that, that now that we're stable, like we won't do any crazy changes. And there are going to be some changes that might be a little annoying. And like before we hit that, like they, they shouldn't be very big. You know, there, there's not going to be any 180 on any decision that we've made before, but there are some fixes that we need to make and they might actually cause some churn. Yeah, creativity is hard right now. Oh yeah. Like you said. <laughs> it is. Uh, just trying to like find the extra energy to to muster it. I, I know myself, I'm having the same issue with trying to create these new courses I'm doing. So I, I can understand with as many things as you're juggling. You mentioned being the release manager and I, I had gotten a few questions from some of my real Python team members. And first I wanted to just ask like, what is the job of being the Python 3.8, 3.9 release manager? What does that look like? 
actually the most important thing i uh, i really think the release manager is doing is kind of hurting the cats a bit okay just to to be like a human reminder that like the, the time has come and you should be doing this particular thing at this particular moment in time right so there is a lot of users of python who depend on the release cadence to just happen, right? They need a release at a given moment in time. This is important because we might miss release of our Linux distribution if we are going, you know, too slow. Sure. Or there is a project that embeds Python and they really need kind of a blessed newer version. Of course, there are security releases. So whenever there is an actual security problem, we need to release it as fast as possible and whatnot. So there are certain like kind of events in in time of a maintenance of a project where you just need to release. And I fully understand the irony of me saying this while people ask me for a black release for months now. Um, so yeah, I get it. Uh, we probably should hire a release manager for black then. But speaking of CPython, the thing is this. We have a consistent calendar of releases for over a decade now. It's been less kind of in stone before that, but still it was pretty good. Like, you know, I, I look at the history, you know, of releases then and, you know, kind of I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. But these days, um, entire industries relate, well, actually really depend on CPython. So the most important thing is really to tell people like, hey, now is the time. Right? And suddenly at this particular moment, like, you know, with the events of the world as they happen now, the, the job is a bit harder because the calendar that we, that we set up, like was specifically set up so that we had this opportunity at sprints after PyCon to just gather around, finish some of the remainder work. Right. Right. Just before we, we hit beta. Beta is this kind of self-inflicted freeze for us where we say we will not add new features for it. We are stabilizing the release for, you know, release candidate and the final release uh, a few months later. Beta is this kind of hard deadline where if you don't make it, you won't make the release. You will have to wait another, well, it used to be 18 months, but as a release manager, I actually wrote a pep and made it just a year. I, I really do think that annual releases work better with human brains. Uh, so now now it's 12 months, but still, if you miss your feature, you're going to have to wait another year. And having to wait another year, what it really means is it will probably be usable by your users maybe three, maybe four years from now, right? Because the Linux distributions don't ship with it. Uh, or if you are a library maintainer, you have to support older versions still. So if there's something totally new, you know, many people will not be able to just easily go ahead and use it from day one. You know, those sprints I was really excited for, and now they're gone, but yeah, you know, we, we, we're going to have to make do without them. But yeah, that, that's essentially the job. Yeah. Anthony Shaw asked that question exactly. He was like, how's the team adapting to not having the PyCon sprint? And you pretty much answered it. Yeah, so like one thing that we are doing still is the language summit, right? So the language summit is 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 a very important event. Like I'm chairing this with Mariata, uh, like for the second time now, and you know the first time was kind of a challenge because it was his first time for us uh, after having Barry and Larry do it for a bunch of years. But now with this situation, we felt like we could just rather easily say it's canceled like the rest of PyCon and people would be kind of fine with it. It would be, you know, like it, it would just be fair, but it would just be bad for the project. Like we already invited a bunch of people uh, to the language summit uh, to speak on certain subjects. And we wanted to have the people in the room to discuss those things. And now just canceling this, well, would mean that, you know, we were going to have no forum for, those intermediate conversations and it's not just core developers there's representatives of you know external projects like beware uh you know like other interpreters and whatnot so i i felt really bad at just kind of giving up on this so we we talked with mariata about like hey are we doing this and we decided yeah like let, let's let's try to make this an online event and it's in fact we made it 
a two-day event from what usually is a single full-day event. And why? Because time zones, right? And even though PyCon US is in the US, many of the people who may make it important are from Australia or, you know, um, Eastern or Western Europe and, you know, all over the place, actually, you know. So we wanted this to be still inclusive and productive. But it was simply impossible, not not just because of our incompetence, but literally the shape of the planet made it impossible for us. So we decided just to split it from, okay, we, we, I, I'm saying we because it sounds great, but it was Mariada's brilliant idea to just, hey, like, what if we don't have one eight hour meeting? It sounds terrible to do an eight hour Zoom meeting. Like, you know, just think about yeah. it. What if we do two, yeah, right? two four hour meetings but make it in different times at every you know like each each so different people can contribute at different times so we decided like us is you know where pycon was supposed to happen so it's going to be for this particular moment the center of the world you know i'm not saying it's not for anything else you know it depends on you know where, where you're standing but for the purposes of the language summit is the center of the world. So on day one, it's going to be friendly towards uh, the US and Europe. On day two, it's going to be friendly towards US and Australia. Right. So day two is going to be 1 a.m. for me when the language summit starts. So oh, wow. it's going to be funny. Uh, you know, it's going to be like a few coffees and maybe a Red Bull to 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 get me through it. Uh, but it's 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 all for the community because. A, f a few very important people who I wanted very much to be able to contribute are in Australia. So, you know, kind of, it just felt right. So we are still meeting, right? There's not going to be sprints or maybe there are actually sprints are comparatively rather easy to, to, to organize. Like, you know, we should probably actually do this still. Like, you know, you should just say like, you know, let's organize on IRC or whatever and just let's do a bunch of things in the week. That, so that's still possible. But for the language summit, we actually needed to have like, you know, people invited, people have talks prepared, you know, kind of decide that, hey, we're actually going to do this, raise your hand and discuss with 50 people on it. Well, there's not 50 people now because not everybody obviously agreed to be part of this. They have different well, requirements now, and they have, maybe they cannot do this because of time zones, maybe because of Zoom, maybe because of other reasons. Um, but most people actually w reacted to this with great enthusiasm, which I feel like, oh yeah, okay, so it's worth it. So, so, so that's good. So yeah, so, so the team was always kind of designed to work in a long term, right? Online, through issues, through mailing lists, through discourse these days to... Uh, but there are some moments in time where I feel it's crucial for us to have a connection that is more real time than this. That's one of the reasons why I, I pushed so hard to have the dedicated sprints every year for Python. Those are also canceled this year, sadly, even though they were supposed to happen in, in autumn. But we already know that, you know, the hosting company uh, has policy that goes kind of essentially uh, to the end of the year that there's no external travel allowed and we we understand this so it's reasonable um we, we also don't know how uh, life will look like you know in autumn uh, yet so yeah it's a big if anyway but i felt like the least that we can do is actually make the language summit happen so it will happen it will happen literally tomorrow uh, the other question that he had was, is the beta one on schedule as far as it looks or is it getting shifted? Uh, everything is on schedule. So regardless of like, you know, uh, coronavirus, regardless of uh, shelter in place and whatnot, there are more, there are higher responsibilities there, right? Like, you know, so as I said, like entire industries depend on Python now and it's super important in data science and AI and whatnot, machine learning now. And especially now, given, you know, this kind of global situation, like you don't want to, you know, kind of cause any sort of stagnation, right? So maybe what we're going to get is a release that is a bit more kind of laid back in terms of new features, right? Maybe the release is going to be a little smaller than usual, but it's going to be there, right? There's already things that we implemented and shipped and they're already waiting for a release. So Beta one is not shifting. It's going to be shipped uh, as planned. 
of course, you know, there's been situations so far already, like with 3.8 as well, where, uh, you know, not all releases happen on the day that is in the PEP. Sometimes things happen, you know, sometimes somebody's sick or they're just away for vacation or just, you know, at the day of release, you come in and check the status of the build bots and they're all red because somebody just checked in something that broke everything the day before. Wow. So, you know, like obviously some leeway is allowed, you know, kind of, you know, we, we're we not, we're not kind of real time scheduling here. Right. However, like, you know, we're going to do our best to, you know, adhere to the schedule as written in the pep. Cool. Another kind of just quick question on that is just, how did you get the role? Like, how did you get involved with becoming a release manager? Honestly, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah like i'm rather open about this that like you know the the previous group of release managers uh is 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 very small right you know it's not a role that you assign very often in fact now one of the things that i'm you know i'm i'm kind of well this this isn't this is not going to be released uh, un, uh until after language summit so i'm not really spoiling anything for anybody like you know okay <laughs> yeah uh one of the things that i want to discuss tomorrow with people is that hey like actually I'm already kind of aware that I am going to be the release manager for Python 3.10 as well. First of all, I shifted the release cadence. So it's kind of, it's fair for me to just take on another one now that, that the release cadence is different, but also now with all of the shelter in place stuff and, you know, all of this uncertainty, it is really not maybe a good moment to just find somebody new to just teach how the release management uh, stuff works. However, we should already be looking at somebody to shadow me with 3.10 from start to finish so that we can have a new release manager for 3.11, right? Uh, so that is going to be a topic that we should be looking uh, for somebody like that. And now, like, how did I become one? Uh, well, so the, the group of release managers are relatively small, right? Uh, but there's certain expectations that people do have for a release managers. Like, the most important probably is that you're not going to disappear midway, <laughs> right? So first of all, like, you should be somebody who was there already, right, uh, for a while, like, you know, in terms of contribution, like, people know you, like, both in person and kind of for the contributions you made. Because honestly, like, you know, there, there's a certain extent of trust that you get with that role and certain amount of damage that you can do, right? You know, I'm like one of the three people that can force push to, to see Python, right? So Wow, yeah. <laughs> I, I could break stuff if, if, I, if I was incompetent. And, you know, don't look at the history because I might have actually done force pushes, but, you know, it was for the best at the time. But the thing is, like, you know, there, there is certain power that you get with this, right? You know, admin rights on GitHub, like, you know, you can, you can do a lot with this. So it's also a certain amount of responsibility for how you deal with your own data and your own hardware, right? So kind of, I almost think that my experience with Facebook, a, a big employer, like where like this kind of care is important is literally, I'm professionally trained to do this was, was, was a factor, right? Because, you know, you, you're less likely to just uh, lose your credentials somehow, right? You know, be kind of a victim of a hack, you know, on on some abandoned website where you use the same password as the password that you're using for GitHub and whatever. So that was a factor. But also, a release manager doesn't really have to code much for the role. But what I need to do sometimes is to decide what to do when stuff is read. Right. When stuff is read, then you have a bunch of kind of possibilities, right? You can either go and fix it yourself, which I sometimes do for things that are really easy. And especially if, if this is something that there's relatively little time to just go through a big, you know, uh, review cycle. But then otherwise you need to decide, you know, is, is it a breakage that really kind of should stop the release? And if it should, then should we stop the release? Because we can either postpone it or we can revert the change, right? But reverting the change is kind of a heavy hammer, right? You, you also don't want to overdo it because then everybody hates you, right? You just revert their stuff all the time because you they broke something that is not actually that important in the grand scheme of things yet. For example, I don't know, introducing a memory leak in the alpha stage, right? Yes, we should fix it, but maybe, you know, it's not so important to just remove somebody's important feature just because of that, right? So so there's a certain 
a certain amount of judgment that you have to do every time. And to make that judgment, sometimes you have to dive in hairy C code and see like, oh yeah, okay, I, I see where this is going at least. So there's a certain breadth of, of your Python experience that is expected, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, but how I got chosen and not somebody else, like who were the other candidates and what, it, what that was like, you know, that I will never know, I guess. And maybe I don't want to know, actually, so I don't know. But what, <laughs> what, what did happen was that uh, at some point I just received an email, like, you know, kind of just casually like, hey, like, we're thinking of a bunch of people for this, you know, like, uh, sh should, we, should we put you on the list for that or not? And I thought about this for a while and I'm like, no, because you never told me what that means. What, you never not told me, like, what is involved. And they were like, okay, so you passed the first test. And now, like, you know, we are going to tell you and then you'll decide. So I, I kind of had a few conversations with Larry Hastings and with Ned Dealey and Barry Warsaw, I think. And they essentially all told me that, like, you know, it's just annoying work for eight years for free. And I just thought, like, hey, awesome. And, um, and here I am. <laughs> I have just a couple last Questions. These are kind of like repeating questions that I try to ask everybody who comes on. And the first one is, what are you excited about in the world of Python? And this could be an event or coding tools or packages. Just something that you're excited about that's happening in the world of Python. Well, so first of all, I come from this kind of world where I kind of connect a bunch of things and maybe they, they do a thing, maybe they don't work and then you kind of beat at it until until it actually works as intended. So kind of less theoretical than, than, than most people maybe. But at the same time, like, you know, I, I do have some interest in this kind of composability uh, area, right? And I always was fascinated by like, what Python actually is, right? Like, what, did, what does it mean for something to be Python, right? Like, if you started a new project, right, and just put it on, on the browser and just call it, like, you know, so, so, some Python variant, what would it need to do for it to still be Python? What could you strip for it to be absolutely, oh, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's a new language, it's kind of Python-like, but it's definitely not Python. But what could you strip and still have called Python? And... An amazing example of this is circuit Python, right? Or in general, like micro Python. Uh, so a project that runs on hardware, which is amazingly close to what we understand as Python, like coding on the big machines, right? And circuit Python in particular is cool because it is a variant of micro Python that you can just plug in via USB and it just becomes a drive and you can just put files there. It will restart your device and you can just run it like right away. Yeah. So the growth of CircuitPython is something that I'm really excited about because of course the talk that I'm just recording and failing with OBS, damn you OBS, uh, is async IO and music. So kind of sequencing MIDI with Python. So Obviously, I'm thinking of packaging this somehow and just, you know, kind of use it uh, in a hardware fashion. And in fact, what I did first thing in the morning yesterday was to order both modules of Tia's new company, Winterbloom, which are Eurorack synthesis, uh, you know, modular synthesis modules that you can reprogram in CircuitPython. And while uh, once I receive them, I'm rather kind of excited to try out the things that I cover in my talk just to put them like in actual hardware where you don't even have to start your laptop to know that hey I'm doing music with python now so that's one thing I'm excited about yeah and the other thing that I'm excited about and and that's actually really fresh is starlet you know just for the kind of leading example of the videos that I'm doing for the HDB YouTube channel now. Uh, like, I was like, we really need some small web app that I'm going to show the, the connecting bits with something, as you mentioned, smarter than just time sleep, right? Because time sleep just feels off. It's like, this is useless. This doesn't look like a real thing, right? Because it's not. Right. So I wanted something to be kind of nicer than this. And I started playing with Starlet and it kind of feels like the early days of Django all over again. Like, you know, I have like all the feels. It just feels just right. So kind of if you haven't tried Starlet yet, you know, kind of I highly encourage it. It's, it's a lot of fun. You're going to get uh, very far, very quickly. It's kind of 
opinionated but pluggable so you can replace parts of it for example like you know we're obviously going to be using hdb for the uh for the backend database for it but you don't have to you can just use mysql or postgres you know or whatnot so yeah so circuit python is one thing i'm pretty excited about these days and then starlet that's great if you were gonna have to think back to when you were learning python if you had to go back and learn python from scratch what would you change about how you you know, approach learning it? Well, uh, it's kind of hard to say what I would do differently just because a lot of what I did was just pure randomness. It was like my entire uh, discovery of Python was literally the Ruby installer failing on my Windows XP box. So I was hard pressed in time, like, you know, uh, at that point. So I literally wrote Ruby alternative in Google, you know, at that time. And Python is what I found. So like, you know, if, if the Ruby installer worked that day, like, you know, we would probably not be talking now. <laughs> right. A lot of my other discoveries were like this as well. Right. So I'm not sure, like, you know, whether there was a lot of deliberate uh, things that I did in the first place. So telling telling you what I would change about it is kind of a theoretical exercise because not only is, is it in the past, but I, I didn't have much planning, you know, in the first place when I was learning it. Um, what I did find effective, though, and what I think other people should kind of try out as well, is doesn't matter how little you know, there is something worthwhile you can accomplish with Python today. So you should make sure to just do practical projects as soon as possible, because that is something that makes for much better retention of whatever you're learning. Just going through a bunch of tutorials and nodding that I understand them is nice, but it's, it's just going to go, uh, you know, go in with one ear and just out with the other. So practical projects is how you actually gain experience. Yeah, I totally agree with that. That's been my background of like getting into Python and following all these tutorials, but it's not necessarily something you're going to want to even show other people. It's like, yeah, I created this thing in this book. But when you create a project that is scratching your own itch or, you know, solving what programming is all about is problem solving. And so I completely agree that the idea of just get in and start making stuff, even if it, it's it's going to be simple, it's going to be something that isn't necessarily that impressive, but it's at least it's something that you created and you've solved the problem with. Yeah, but then again, now with Circuit Python, even if you know very little about Python, you can do pretty impressive stuff because it's going to have actual LEDs that actually blink in in the in the ways that you made it, or actually it's going to be something that you know kind of waters your plant when the humidity goes be, below something because you <laughs> right. you bought some some Adafruit, fruit you know kind of thing. So you know it's it's actually not very hard to do something rather impressive these days with Python. And also, if you're in any way like into data science, just firing up a notebook, just getting a CSV from your government and suddenly kind of drawing graphs from it, you know, and showing it to, to, to people around you, like, you know, that's already impressive, right? Yeah, totally. You are actually doing, you know, kind of computer science now, right? Yeah. Kind of doesn't matter how little you know, like there's always something practical you can do today. Cool. So what is something that you thought you knew well in Python, but it turned out you were wrong about it. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, so one thing that I learned when I first started contributing to Python is that there is a number of things that look easy from afar, right? Like, you know, kind of, why didn't those idiots fix it, you know, already, right? Like, I will tell you, like, it's so easy. Like, just do this, you know, why, how come doesn't Python do this one thing? And then you actually go closer to the problem. You look at it and it turns out that actually the low hanging fruit has have been picked like long, a long time ago. Like, and the, the problems that are left are very rarely easy. Yeah. One particular example that I was annoyed by and every now and again, I still am is the lack of a do while loop in Python. Right. Like, you know, you have a while loop, you have a for loop, but you don't have a loop that has at least a single execution guaranteed. Right. You know, this the, the very typical do while loop. Um, the reason why you don't is that there is just not a nice syntax for this in a language that has significant indentation. Obviously, if you have an idea right now, probably somebody already suggested it and there's problems with it. 
that was one of the examples that I had. It was like, hey, how come can can't we do this? And it was very quickly uh, proven to me that you know there's very many reasons why we cannot. So just this approach of problems where kind of you don't know the entire context was probably something that I was doing rather, you know, badly at first. Like, you know, I, I, I had plenty of solutions, right? And the closer you looked, the more you, you discovered that, you know, kind of things are hard. And the, the longer you're at it, you also value the boring parts the most, right? You know what the biggest innovation of Python 3 was? Actually, a lot of people hate Python 3 for it, but the 10 years of absolute stability of Python 2.7, that was like an amazing time for Python developers where essentially they had a language that they could just run with and they knew that, you know, the language is not going to significantly change under them and become incompatible suddenly. Well, there was Python 3 that was already incompatible, but for Python 2.7, they were golden, you know, like there, there were no 2.8, 2.9 releases, right? Right. And that actually taught us a bit that, hey, maybe even in Python 3, we should be way more gradual about changes and way more conservative. Uh, there were proposals to just remove dead batteries, you know, we should remove some of them. And I agree that there is a number that it is just kind of bad practice that we still let them be there. But for others, like, you know, yeah, maybe there's a new, better way to do things, but why remove the old one and break a 10-year-old program? There's, there's little reason to do so. The respect for backwards compatibility is something that I'm learning slowly, especially in a language like Python where you don't really have a compiled artifact that you can keep running even if the interpreter runs away from you and looks differently later on. You run on the latest interpreter, so it better accept your old code. So yeah, like... That was probably one thing. I, I don't I don't know if I can, uh, if that satisfies your question. No, it does. It does. It's a different tack on it, but I, I get where you're coming from, and it definitely relates to your experience in being the release manager for Python three eight and all those kind of considerations going forward. I, I really want to thank you for taking so much time away from all the things you're doing to talk to me. It's been really awesome. That's all good. I also enjoyed it. Like it's it's not very often that I actually meet somebody who has like, you know, deep knowledge of MIDI and you know, a, a kind of similar background in that sense. So so that was a pleasure. Well great. Thanks again. Thank you. I want to thank Wukush Langa for being my guest this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python Podcast. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast in your favorite player. And if you like the show, Leave us a five-star rating and a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.